Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. Pumped to have you here with us today. We've got another great show we're rolling out for you. As you well know, all this last month, we have had an emphasis on the brain, our mind, mindfulness, neuroscience, and more. Over the past month, we've had Dr. Rick Hansen and Forrest Hansen, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Last week, we had the amazing Sarah Fay with her unbelievable story, an amazing book. And we're rounding out this emphasis we have with Max Lugavere, who is, of course, the New York Times bestselling author of the book, Genius Foods, Becoming Smarter, Happier, and More Productive While Protecting Your Brain for Life. That's right. His whole diet is really based around brain health. He also hosts iTunes' number one health podcast, The Genius Life. He's been on Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, The Doctors, featured on Fast Company, CNN, on and on and on the list goes. Filmmaker, health and science journalist. We are talking eating for your brain health. Come on. This is like a full service podcast. <laughs> All right. Hey, it really helps us if you go and give us five stars on iTunes or leave a review on whatever platform you listen to. It helps other people find this podcast. We are so grateful that you're here. I'm so happy that you get to hear Max today. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. Max Lugavere, Enneagram 3, welcome to Typology. Thank you for having me. What a what a treat. I'm excited for this for this conversation that we're about to have. I feel like it's going to be a fun one and a novel one. It's it's going to be all that. And for those of you who are watching, uh, I want to hold up two books that have become taken on biblical imports <laughs> in my house uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, one is uh, this New York Times bestseller of Max's Genius Foods. Uh, become smarter, happier, and more productive while protecting your brain. We're going to focus in on that for a little bit. Your brain for life. And then we have this one, Genius Kitchen, which is over 100 and easy and delicious recipes to make your brain sharp, body strong, and taste buds happy. So we're going to be talking all about food and the Enneagram today, which is Sweet. a brand new combination, Anthony. I like it. Breaking new ground. I love it. I'm excited. <laughs> Absolutely. Max, um, I'm excited about this conversation. And we're gonna we can circle back to it because I know you have thoughts about this topic. My wife and I are kind of health nuts, right? Um, my wife, uh, I mean, for the last three decades, has four decades, she bought nothing but organic food for our kids, right, Anthony? Oh, yeah. There is not a pesticide to be found in my house. <laughs> right. My kids, the only orange thing in my kids' lunch bag was carrots. Okay. There were no Cheetos. There was nothing like that. Okay. Right. So we don't eat processed food. We don't eat a, a lot of sugar, if very little processed sugar. Uh, and I know we're going to have a conversation about this. We're vegan, but we're not, but we're not fundamentalists about it. Okay. So, and we don't do it because we don't like meat people or because we don't like meat or stuff like that. So we have a whole different set of reasons for it. And, you know, we're huge yoga people and, you know, big workout people. I, I know you can tell from my large, <laughs> my your, large your intimidating posture. <laughs> that's it. My intimidating posture. Right. So anyway, that's why I'm psyched to get into this conversation. But before we jump in, you're an Enneagram three. I know you're new to the Enneagram and you, you took a test. Did you read the results? I did read the results. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it, it read very much like, a like an autobiography of, of me, but you know, I, I felt like I was, I, as I was reading it, I mean, chronologically it, uh, it, I guess I'm the second next best match for me is the eight. Uh, I'm a 91% match. And I read that and I, I, as I was reading it, I was like, oh, that's a perfect match. That must be what I am. And then I scrolled down further and I realized that my, the, the primary, um, type that I am is the number three, which, uh, is, it definitely matches. Like, I feel like I, I relate to the description of the three, you know, defined by a desire to achieve that, that makes a ton of sense to me, but, um, 
but you know, I don't, I don't, I see myself more as being, I don't know, I guess it's, it's split. Like, I, I think I, I see myself more as being an eight than a three, although maybe it's, maybe it's about 50, 50, because it's not that I'm so much ambitious as I am unwilling to settle for, uh, the status quo. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why I probably the, the primary reason why I got started in the work that I'm doing is because I felt the need to stand up for what I believe in with regard to medical care and, and health care and, and well wellness, um, which is, I think, more indicative of like an eight being being a primary match. But um, but no, I think uh, I, I think that this is actually like it is really cool in that it's they if you could combine both, they do seem to be a near match for for me and my and my personality and my drive what drives me so yeah I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that you've given me to uh go deep into this great so i'm going to just give you two statements and you tell me which of the two comes closest not perfectly but comes closest to describing who you are now you, you may think gosh these are both kind of negative statements but uh, I want you, uh, because the Enneagram will tell you what's worst about you is what's best about you, and what's best about you is what's worst about you, uh, there, there's going to be a slight bit of, you might feel like negativity, but don't let that throw you, okay? okay? So the first statement is this, I have a need, right, a drive to succeed, to appear successful to others, and to avoid failure pretty much at all costs, though not always, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for that type, uh, you would be particularly image conscious. Don't feel bad about that. There's two other types that are equally image conscious, right? So the way that you are perceived by others would be important. And then your capacity to project an image of success is something you're really great at doing. And mm -hmm. you love to get the feedback. It's almost like you love to see in other people's eyes the look of admiration. Hmm. Right? You love you like people when people admire you. In fact, in some ways, it's possible that you would prefer to be admired than liked. OK, uh, for this particular type. Um, the other one would be this. I have a need to uh, control, assert power and strength and control over others in the environment in order to mask uh, tenderness, vulnerability, and weakness from myself and others. Which of those two sounds more like you? The first one, for okay. sure. Okay. All right. That's a three. That's a three. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess that's true. I mean, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I get a massive dopamine hit um, feeling of reward uh, for those, you know, unfamiliar with the, with the, with the uh, neurotransmitter um, when I am confronted by people who appreciate my work you know, fan, whether they're fans or new followers or uh, positive reviews, reviews left on my work, comments. I mean, I guess that would be in line with, um, with, uh, with a number three. And, uh, and, al and also it, it probably is why I, it's, it's probably, I mean, because I, I get a fair amount of criticism. Um, and, and on social media these days, you know, you can't be a public facing figure without exposing yourself to some degree of online hate. I mean, it's just, it's so easy for anonymous trolls to come over and, and leave um, negative comments that if I wasn't buoyed by the, by the, by how gratifying the, the, the experience of uh, being admired by, by comparatively such a large uh, um, proportion of people, then I probably wouldn't have the, the stomach for the negative comments. So mm -hmm. That, yeah, I do, I do see that there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. Some threes, I would say, often feel like society in general only values people for what they achieve and do rather than for who they are inside as a, as a person. And I would say that's kind of a story they tell themselves that's not necessarily true, but they pick it up as a little person and then unconsciously drag it into adulthood and continue to live by its dictates, right? So does that resonate with you that, you know, you kind of see a world that's like only really cares uh, or evaluates others by their successes versus who they are inside? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I do relate to that. And, and that, that uh, divide 
I guess has motivated me to, um, to show the world who I am inside. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and my work is very much a, a, a reflection of that. Um, and, and my, how I portray myself on social media. It's, it's really, I've always said that I'm a, like that I'm an, o an open book and f my career from day one has always been about sharing my journey with others. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. Hmm. Well, I mean, we love having threes on and because, you know, threes are ambitious, they're driven, they love efficiencies, right? Hmm. They, they don't like things slowing them down or slowing what down what they're doing. You know, uh, they are very, uh, concerned with, uh, you know, obviously I mentioned appearance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they are, uh, very, uh, how do I want to say this? They are productivity monsters, right? They just love productivity. They're great at seeing opportunities and getting to the finish line first. Uh, to them, coming in second is just losing, right? Wow. Like you, you've always got to be number one. You got to be the best at everything you do. And you kind of feel like a failure if you're not the best <laughs> at what you do. Now you're laughing. Why is that? Well, because I've I've also put myself in a position where I've had to get used to a fair degree of rejection. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that's like from my time spent working in Hollywood uh, to the fact that I write books and, you know, writing books, you are you're kind of defined in many ways by the bestseller lists that you hit or the the numbers of books that you're able to sell. But the fact that I um I guess early on in Hollywood, my experience was my experience was was really good, followed by a very negative experience where I where I did face a lot of rejection. And that's what I guess drove me to create my own platform, which today I have. Um, and so, yeah, rejection is 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 pretty painful. But I guess I've, I've developed a bit of scar tissue to uh, to to protect myself um, from it. Mm. So just so you know. An Enneagram 8 would not say rejection was necessarily very painful. They would be more like flip you off, be like, whatever. You know, they would not. They're pretty thick skinned. Yeah. Uh, I've developed. No, I've developed that. I've, I've developed that. I mean, I mean, I guess, you know, my the my response to rejection is all I know. I don't I don't know how somebody else experiences rejection. So for me, I mean, it's it's not it's not a pleasant feeling, but I guess it's not you know, maybe it's not as bad for me as it is for others, because lo and behold, I've continued down this path, where I do get, as I mentioned, criticism and and rejection in various forms, uh, still today on a on a daily, almost daily basis. Um, so I, I, I guess it's safe to assume that for me, it's not as profoundly debilitating uh, and earth shattering as it is for for other people. I'm also I feel like driven by um, what Jordan Peterson calls the noble aim, you know, like a, like a, like a, an aim, a North star that's larger than myself, which kind of keeps me afloat despite the occasional, uh, egoic setbacks, um, whether it's haters in the comment section or rejection, you know, or didn't make this list or I didn't hit these numbers. The fact that I feel that I have a, um, a noble aim, something larger than myself that, that compels me forward is uh you know like a missionary like a missionary on a mission doesn't care what you, you know negative words you have to say about him right because he's like he's a man for god i'm not religious but for, like for me my noble aim is helping people get healthier mm -hmm. uh around the world and that's a really great point for everybody right i think that regardless of your personality type or style your way of showing up for life uh you need uh purpose right you you need a sense of that which the noble aim Right. Uh, and I would say, in fact, we were just on a conversation an earlier interview today with Sarah Fay, mm -hmm. who just wrote an amazing book called Pathological, uh, her journey through six misdiagnoses. Right. And it was a fantastic interview. Uh, and she talks about purpose as being like so important to mental health. Like if you don't have purpose, people uh, and place, yes. those are the three P's, then you're screwed. Right. Like if you don't have people to support you, 
uh, a healthy context in which to live, right? So if you're living in a home where you're getting battered, bad place, got to get out, bad for mental health. And then purpose, though, is so important. So that's just, I think that's true uh, for everybody uh, across the board. And I also understand haters and being trolled, right? Because in my line of work as an author uh, with, you know, bestsellers, I've gotten the crap kicked out of me, right? I, people, you know, make fun of you. People tell you that you're full of crap. People say that's, you know, whatever. I'm pretty thin skinned, actually. Like I have to burn calories to be well defended <laughs> against that material. Right. But I'm an Enneagram type who would be thin skinned. Mm. And I just have to be mindful. Like, you know what? You're kind of thin skinned and you help a lot more people than the, you know what I mean? Like the numbers are definitely stacked in your favor as being someone who helps people. Don't worry about, because I'll focus in on that one mm -hmm. negative voice and there'll be like 8,000 other interviews on Amazon. They're like, oh, he's killer. This changed my life. And there's one person. Right. <laughs> right. And that's the one I'll focus on for the rest of the day. <laughs> so anyway, Max, let's talk about these books, right? Uh, and just by way of reminder, everybody, Genius Foods. And the other one is Genius Kitchen. You have an amazing backstory uh, uh, as to what inspired you to write these books. I want folks to hear it. Yeah, thank you, Ian. I um, So I started as a, as a journalist. My first job out of college was working for Al Gore. He had a TV network in the United States called Current TV. Um, and I was literally straight out of, out of University of Miami where I double majored in film and, and psychology. And they hired me to anchor the network, ultimately becoming the face of uh, this, this mission that was larger than the network itself. It was to help young people seize the reins of traditional media and change the face of television. Now this launched in 2005. It was like right around the same time that YouTube launched. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I invested all my effort into current TV as opposed to YouTube. But uh, I, I learned a ton and I got to work with some of the uh, some of the top journalists and storytellers um, in Hollywood today, many who've uh, given house journalists who are currently household names um, their first jobs. And so I did that for six years, got to really cut my teeth, uh, learning how to how to investigate a given topic, um, convey a delicate you know topics that are of a delicate nature, potentially to a mass audience because the show, the network was um, streaming to 100 million homes through their through their TV sets. And I did that. My passions have always been um, nutrition and fitness, though. I was I was I started college on a pre med track, and for as long as I can remember, I'd been passionate about nutrition science. Um, just something personally that I was I was very much into, and uh, was always whenever I had free time, diving into PubMed and 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 trying as best as I could to stay up to date on on what the research was saying about um, fitness and nutrition. Uh, my mom who's the most important person in my life at around the age of 58 started to show the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a, a rare form of dementia called Lewy body dementia. It's akin to having both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time. It's an incurable progressive condition. And I had no prior family history of any kind of neurodegenerative disease. So I couldn't really chalk up what I was seeing in my mom to genetics. Uh, in fact, my mom's mom, my maternal grandmother was 90, in her 90s at the time, and she was cognitively sharp as a tack. I also wasn't able to chalk up what I was seeing in my mom to old age because my mom wasn't old. She still had all the pigment in her hair. She was a, a you know, fast walking, fast talking New Yorker. But when she started to get sick, it was like a bomb going off in my world. And I, I started going with her to doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment, starting in New York City, which is where I'm from. And in every instance, I experienced what I've come to call diagnose and adios. And it's not, I'm not being hyperbolic. It's, it's true. When you're sitting in these doctor's offices, they run a, a battery of esoteric tests. Um, and my mom's condition granted wasn't a, a typical presentation of, uh, you know, any of these more common forms of dementia. So it really wasn't until a trip that we had to take to the Cleveland clinic in Ohio, where she was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease and, and she was pre prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And so I was out of work at the time. I uh, had left my position at Current, and I, I was with her in, you know, like Googling, like any millennial with a data plan would do, Googling the drugs that, that she was prescribed. And phrases started to stand out 
to me, like no disease modifying treatment, terminal. Nobody's ever recovered from from these conditions. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever had a panic attack. And from that point on, I just became obsessed with trying to learn everything I possibly could about the etiology of these conditions, uh, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, the role that diet and lifestyle play in one's predilection to to developing um, them. And I certainly don't know everything. But, you know, as a as a journalist, you're equipped tools to investigate a given topic. And I'd always had been passionate about health and nutrition. And I always, um, I also realized that I had media credentials. So I had sort of an upper hand that uh, others in my position might not necessarily have had. So I started reaching out to scientists and, and clinicians around the world. And this began about eight years ago. And I discovered that um, dementia often begins in the brain decades before the first symptom of memory loss. And this actually shouldn't come as a surprise because it's not like cardiovascular disease or cancer develops the night before a diagnosis, right? These are long lead conditions. These are the kinds of conditions that now really kind of dominate um, public health. According to the World Health Organization, 60% of people now die um, due to these chronic non-communicable, what are called diseases of civilization. And my mom was one of those, was, was one such victim. And so... I've just become obsessed with learning um, and, and communicating, teaching uh, to the best of my ability, how one might live for better cognitive health mm -hmm. to really batten down the hatches so that um, one hopefully doesn't have to experience what it was that my mom experienced. And it's led to the writing of Genius Foods and, and the new cookbook, Genius Kitchen. Um, and there are, these are multifactorial conditions. I would never point a finger at, at diet and say it's the sole smoking gun, but diet plays a, a major role, um, in the health of our brains. And so happy to, happy to, happy to go, you know, deeper into my research. But, um, but all that is to say, you know, we now live in a time where we no longer need to sit idly on our hands. We can take steps in our day-to-day -day life that can buy us additional months, years, maybe even decades of cognitive health. Mm -hmm. And I I just want to sort of highlight that because most of the time, the focus of attention for people writing in your genre is the heart, right? The focus mm -hmm. is on uh, the cardiovascular system. It's on, you know, diabetes, right? Type two diabetes, how do we reverse it? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you're focused in on brain health which is really interesting to me. No, that's not to say that the kinds of, you know, dietary recommendations you make won't have positive, right, uh, heart outcomes, right? But you're really zeroing in on brain health, which I find really, really interesting, right? Um, so you got me for 10 minutes in an elevator. We're stuck in the elevator, man. <laughs> and uh, I'd look at you and I find out what you do for a living. We start talking and I said, man, I only got 10 minutes here. Uh, how should I change my relationship with food? What changes do I make in order to best ensure good brain functioning or health throughout my life? Yeah, it's a, I mean, that's a great starting place. And I would have answered this question differently a year ago and certainly differently five years ago. But today I feel that um, sticking to a diet that is predominantly comprised of whole minimally processed foods, that's the low hanging fruit for most people. Today, by and large, your average American is overindulging on what are called ultra processed foods to the tune of about 60% of daily calories. So to put that another way, 60% of the calories that your average person is consuming comes from ultra processed foods, foods basically shelf stable um, convenience foods made in a, in a factory, usually comprised of refined grain products um, or legumes like wheat, corn, rice, uh, soy is another big one. Um, and these, these foods really are at the foundation of the, certainly the um, obesity epidemic, which we're now seeing by the year 2030, one in two adults is poised to not just be overweight, but obese. Um, but they also drive widespread metabolic dysfunction um, which is very common. Uh, today, about nine in 10 adults have some degree of metabolic illness. Um, and I think it's it's no uh, secret that um, that it's because Americans tend to overconsume these these kinds of food products. So the advice that I would give you is to 
base your diet around minimally processed whole foods. So these are foods that you can recognize, um, single ingredient foods. They don't have extensive ingredients lists. They are the ingredients. Um, foods that you cook yourself at home. It's actually one of the one of the uh, major reasons why I decided to write a cookbook that I felt that home cooking above and beyond conversations about low carb this, low fat that, vegan, carnivore, cooking at home is one of the greatest leverage points that your average person has to improve their health. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's, that's the primary um, starting place. And then we can get a bit more granular. You know, the brain um, requires uh, a certain amount of, of a, a, cer a certain uh, quality and quantity of nutrition with regard to micronutrients. And we can talk about where to find those, those different um, sorts of micronutrients. But I would say by and large, for most people that are metabolically unwell, um, at this point, just get it ditching the ultra processed foods, um, whether they're plant based foods or organic foods or non GMO, if they come in a package and they're shelf stable, you're better off uh, reducing, minimizing, at the very least, uh, your consumption of those foods. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, my wife doesn't even allow me to have a Frito. If I came home having eaten a Frito, she smells it from my pores. <laughs> <laughs> and then she chases me around the house with an artichoke. You know what I mean? And like tells me that uh, I've, I've, you know, I have fed the evil system <laughs> by, uh, by, you know, compromising my dietary wellness. Um, all right. So outcomes, where have you seen where you can validate your theory, right? Like you have seen somebody's brain health improve as a result of their diet. Like, can, is there any like testimonials out there? It's like, man, I did this. I made these changes and now I'm thinking more clearly I'm doing like, is that out there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, great. Another great question. So, I mean, I have plenty of, of anecdotes, right? I'm not a, I'm not a clinician and I haven't um, organized the feedback that I've gotten over the past six years of having my book out in a, in a systematic way. Um, but I will tell you that people who have read um, and, and followed my recommendations, they do report more energy, better sleep, uh, less hunger, less fatigue, um, improved mental health, better cognitive function, um, executive function, for example, processing speed, for example. Um, and these are, you know, anecdotes, like you can have innumerable anecdotes, and it's still they're still anecdotes, right. But um, what the data shows, uh, and this is where it gets, I think, really convincing that we do have a, a powerful say when it comes to um, not just how our brain is functioning in the here and now, but long term brain health outcomes. So I mean, there, there are a number of studies that I cite. Um, but just to, I guess, uh, upfront state 90% of what we know about Alzheimer's disease, which is just the most common form of dementia, but it's not the only form we we've discovered in the past 15 years. So this is a very rapidly evolving field of science. But now finally, we do have a slew of, um, for example, randomized control trials, which are the kinds of trials required to prove cause and effect in humans that show us that um, a full diet and lifestyle intervention um, and a diet that that incorporates many of the foods that, that I recommend on a, on a routine basis um, can not just significantly delay the onset of cognitive decline, but can improve the way one's brain works in the here and now. Uh, one of the more seminal studies is the finger study, the finger trial that is run out of the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. I actually had the p pleasure of visiting there. And what they're finding, what they found in this large population, about 1,200 people over two years, that adhering to uh, you know an exercise regimen, um, and this isn't backbreaking work. These are older adults with at least one risk factor for developing um, dementia, and uh, and a Mediterranean style dietary pattern that they're able to not just um, in a significant way kick the can down the road in terms of cognitive decline, but improve executive function by about 83% and improve processing speed by um, 150%. So that's that's one study. Um, we have another study called the um, Sprint Mind Trial that also provides really great data. This was a trial where people with hypertension, so high blood pressure, were um, pharmacologically being treated, so with a drug treated for their high blood pressure. And what they saw was that um, compared to controls, 
people that were being treated um, had a, a, a significant risk reduction for the development of mild cognitive impairment, which is often considered pre-dementia. So if you have high blood pressure, fixing your blood pressure um, can prevent your own dementia. And we know now, thanks to a number of very high quality meta-analyses that exercise is just as effective for reducing blood pr pressure as drugs are. So, you know, making sure that you're that you're shifting your blood pressure to a healthier state uh, is super, super important. Now, this is all sort of like the long-term brain health stuff, but we are also now at this interesting um, point where now the field of psychiatry is is bending towards all these nutritional insights that are coming out. And there's a field called nutritional psychiatry, which has sort of been jumpstarted over the past couple of years. And there have been a number of uh, randomized control trials that are showing us that a, a dietary pattern, uh, very similar, if not identical to the kinds of diets used in all these, um, you know, other studies I'm talking about, can actually significantly reduce major depression to the point of remission in some patients if if those patients are you know all, uh eating junk food diets for example at the at the study start so i mean that's sort of like the 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 data underlying my recommendations we can also talk about the mind diet which is the sort of like epidemiological uh amalgamation of the mediterranean dietary pattern and the dash dietary pattern which is a dietary pattern meant to stop it's a dietary intervention to stop hypertension. So again, going back to how important blood pressure is, the MIND diet is another diet that's been shown, um, at least in mathematical models, to uh, lead to a dramatic risk reduction for dementia. So there's all these sort of data points. Um, you know, we can look to animal studies, human studies. Um, I think the evidence is is quite clear at this point that uh, that that you can impact the way that your brain functions. Mm. And, and also, you know, just getting back to the metabolic health uh, side of things, if you have type 2 diabetes, your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease increases between two and fourfold. So that's a, a dramatic risk reduction. And many people in this country um, have type 2 diabetes. So that right there is a, is a, is a major modifiable risk, risk factor um, for Alzheimer's disease that uh, the key word there is modifiable. Like you can modify your destiny by not being a type 2 diabetic. So, um, so yeah, so as a, as a non-clinician, you know, I, I lean on these, these studies, but also now at this point, the feedback that I've gotten from people all over the world and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's quite incredible. I'm, I'm humbled because to me, you know, I got into this again because of my mom, the fact that somebody on the other side of the world is, has gravitated to my recommendations and is in a way helping to prevent their own dementia by following them. I mean, to me, that's an incredible thing. And it, it makes me feel that what my family and my mom went, went through wasn't, wasn't ultimately in vain. Mm. So Anthony, let's just spend a minute talking about Enneagram types and diet. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I actually have thought about this and I'm just, because I actually think, and maybe this is an, an you know, an unexplored territory, but you know, personality styles and their relationship to food is different. Each type is different, oh, yeah, it's a thing. right? So there's not one size fits all, right? Um, and so let me just talk about it. So just so you know, Max, ones are called the improvers. And these are, you know, we used to call them the perfectionists, okay? And they are people who are, you know, meticulous, detail-oriented, analytical, they love the rules. They love protocols. They like guidelines. Uh, they are, they like to try and perfect others themselves in the world, right? Now, I think in terms of diet, Anthony, that uh, ones would do very well uh, following the guidelines, Program. the protocols, and everything else that Max right. is describing, right? Like they're just naturally attuned to that, and they like rules, right? The problem is they can become very rigid around rules, right? Like there's no, it's very bad to break a rule, right? I mean, I'm assuming, Max, that every now and then my oatmeal raisin cookie is okay, right? I mean, just as long as I don't have seven a day. Um, and and so, you know, uh, one to be like, now twos, Anthony, yes. I will be honest and say that uh, twos can really indulge. I mean, it's just true. Twos and nines can indulge. Twos are called the helpers, uh, Max, and uh, these are people who have a need to be needed. They're very warm. They're very supportive, you know, very caring. I don't want to do, go too slow through this, but 
You know what I'm saying? Like, and so they will cook what others want to meet their needs. Right. Hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and while disavowing their own, their own, that's right. right? Yeah. Threes, if you're a three max, I would bet for you, although I don't know, man, because I was reading the book and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but the threes I know, I was thinking about one in particular who's very hung up on diet and health and stuff like that. First of all, they do a lot of research, right? They consult experts, but they like efficiencies, right? So how can I do this the quickest? Like, how do I, how do I make this meal, do it and move on, right? I want to do the best, but I want to move on, right? I want to be great at this, but I, I want to move on. Um, fours, which I am, are the individualists for kind of artistic types. I won't go into detail. We love like sevens exotic food, right? Mm -hmm. We love the experimental. We love, you know, um, the different, right? Uh, and uh, that's why you'll, you, you'll often find us in sevens hanging around in strange Turkish restaurants on the outskirts of the city. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just like checking it out. Um, <clears throat> fives, Anthony, talking about diet. We have a mutual friend, Steve, I won't say his last name, who is a five. First yeah. of all, he has every gizmo I've ever seen for cooking in his kitchen. I, I mean, his kitchen looks like a, like a chemistry lab. And he is so into knowledge about food and eating. These folks are called the investigators, uh, Max. They're, wow. They are just amazing people at aggregating knowledge and information, which he has done. He's got reams of cookbooks and, you know, he's got, he puts, he puts crap in bags and dips it in hot water. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you the stuff that he does, right? Sixes, I don't really know, except to say that I think they would love to follow the rules because they're very anxious people. Yeah. They're called the loyalist facts. And I think they would be people that would follow the guidelines in order to be healthier and safe yep. in a world that feels chaotic and overwhelming. Right. Sevens in food, I can just tell you my, my, my son, Max, they're called the enthusiasts. They're spontaneous. They're fun. They're joyful. They are, see a world filled with unlimited opportunity and options, right? I think sevens, man, would, well, I know this from my son. Well, first of all, sometimes he just eats for the joy of it, right? So, and, and he weighs nine pounds and he's six foot, you know? So I, yeah. at this moment in his life, he's not thinking about anything like this. However, they do love exotic food and they want to eat as much of the different op options as they possibly can, right? Yeah. Eights just, you know, they overeat sometimes. They just go over yeah. the top. They're called the challengers. Uh, and they have this wild lust for life. Uh, Max, you're an educated guy. I'm sure you read uh, Kazantzakis' Zorba the Greek. That's what they're like. You know, wow. they, they just are the one like Jim C, another good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. when, Jim, when I asked Jim to come and cook at our house for the Super Bowl, you can't believe what he brings. I mean, he brings so much food in huge pots and, he, you know, it's just the consuming Nines like twos. Remember, food is an archetizer for nines. They're called the peacemakers, Max. And nines, I think, are, are all about comfort food. Yeah. They, they, they love comfort food. And sometimes they can be lazy around food. And they might be the ones, Max, who would spend a lot of time in the middle of the grocery store versus on the outskirts of the grocery store. Whereas you report in the book is where all the healthy food can be found. Yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, it, it, it definitely, our personality types definitely inform how we show up in the world in many different ways. And I have no doubt that they, it, that they influence, um, our, our dietary choices as well. Mm. It's super, I, it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. Because there's no one size fits all. It actually would be an interesting thing to, to write something about different personality styles and then their relationship to food, to money, to, you know, whatever these different things are, because, you know, I meet financial advisors all the time who are like, just do this. And I'm like, well, you could, if you were your type, but if you were these other types, you'd have to have some instruction right. about, yeah. about how to relate to money and food, I think. So yeah. The, anyway. Enne the Enneagram diet. It's your next bestseller. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Let's do that. Uh, That's going to require a ghostwriter, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Question for you, because I, I went through a season where I um, had some real health problems and uh, got healing uh, by doing like an all raw diet for two and a half years. But it was a transition, you know, I, and the first thing I did was cut out processed food. And I love that you gave some practical like low hanging fruit. Are there some other 
sort of low hanging things like, you know, here are five things you can do that aren't so complicated to begin your journey? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that um, recognizing the value of protein um, is super important. And whether you're on a plant-based diet or an omnivorous diet or a, a carnivore diet, carnivores seem less like they need convincing for this, but protein is a very powerful, uh, it's a very important macronutrient, but it's also a very important tool being the most satiating of the macronutrients. Macronutrients, of course, being protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Carbs and fat are essentially energy, right? Protein doesn't easily get converted to fat in the body. It provides the backbone of your musculature. Um, protein breaks down into amino acids that serve as, as the precursor molecules to your neurotransmitters, to enzymes in the body. So protein is crucially important. It's an essential um, macronutrient. And it's the most satiating. In fact, there's what's called the protein leverage hypothesis that stipulates that our, our hunger um, pattern as a whole is driven by our, our, our requirement for amino acids um, mm -hmm. and for protein. So uh, I think that like one really simple tip for people would be to prioritize protein um, in their diets. And this can include uh, grass-fed beef, eggs, fish, poultry, um, legumes like, um, like uh, you know, chickpeas and, and lentils are great high-protein foods if you're on a plant-based diet. Also, soy is not bad. Um, I think soy has gotten a lot of flack, but actually soy is a pretty high quality um, protein source uh, in the in the in the plant kingdom. Um, so prioritizing that at every meal and for snacks also. We don't see a lot of protein deficiency in the Western world, but um, meta analyses are now showing us that uh, the current RDA, which is set at 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, isn't optimal when it comes to um, optimizing metabolic health and body composition. And as I mentioned, most of us today are either overweight or obese, um, about 66%, uh, if not more, of adults are either overweight or obese. And and the vast majority of us are in a state of metabolic disease. So um, prioritizing protein, when when most people make an even incremental increase in their in their protein consumption, they'll they they will tend to see a shift towards a, a better body composition because protein is so satiating. So you eat more protein, you're gonna eat less carbs and fat. Um, it really is a, is a great staple. And also what we find is that protein containing foods are also rich in, they're not just rich in protein, they're rich in micronutrients that we know are crucially important and, and micronutrients um, in particular that tend to be under consumed today. So to me, we've already established that whole foods are the way to go. Now it's about, okay, which are the whole foods that I should prioritize? Look for high protein foods, prioritize those, and then fill out the rest of your plate with um, veggies, whether they're high fiber veggies, um, starchier tubers, for example, sweet potatoes, um, all fantastic options. And then I'm a huge fan of, of whole fruit. Aside from protein, fiber is very satiating. You just don't want to dramatically increase your fiber consumption overnight because it can lead to digestive upset. But the reason why fiber is important is it mechanically, it absorbs water. So it, it stretches out the stomach, which turns off the release of a hunger hormone called ghrelin. So protein, fiber, fiber is incredibly um, satiating. And it also provides uh, an important fuel substrate for gut bacteria. We're now learning about the role that gut bacteria um, the colonic microflora play in, in systemic health. And although we're still very much at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding the full role that they play, um, we do see that people who eat more fiber, um, a richer array of, of plant materials, uh, seem to have better health, less inflammation, um, lower risk for, uh, colon cancer, et cetera. Mm. Okay. You know what, Anthony? Yeah. I think Max is legit. Because <laughs> he's he's spelling it out, man. This guy is, you know, he's not he's not skating on the surface of this topic. No. Okay, he's taking us down into the depths, yeah. you know, which I appreciate. All right, Max, I'm gonna tell you what I what I ate or what I'm eating today, uh, and what I tip. This is not atypical, okay. And feel free to shoot a lot of holes in my diet, okay? Because <laughs> we just we want a straight shot at it, okay? So it. It, all right. So this morning uh, I had <clears throat> a quarter cup of steel cut oats, right? Which I love, right? And it has a little bit of, I put flaxseed in it, right? Uh, I put um, 
a little bit of just a little bit of uh, almond milk and about a half a pint of fresh raspberries, right? Uh, in, in my oatmeal in the morning and, you know, a half calf coffee. I never drink, you know, cause I, you know, I gotta have a little something, right. It's black. So I don't put anything in it. I know I'm getting down to the weeds here, but I want to get my diet, yeah, yeah. this, this oh. analysis done correctly. Then for lunch today, cause we were kind of in a hurry. I had roast broccoli and hummus. I was basically just pounding roast broccoli and hummus. Oh, and those really good, like not cherry tomatoes, whatever you call those things are like multicolored like little tomatoes. I was just pounding on those with hummus because like we didn't have time to stop. When I'm done with this show, I'll go inside and have a protein shake. I often have a protein shake during the day with blueberries. So I put about a good, maybe almost not a quarter cup of blueberries, maybe more half a cup of blueberries in there. It's a really good protein shake. I think it's, was it Garden of Life? Something like that. Mm. Anyway, Garden of Life protein shake. And then tonight my wife makes, we eat a lot of chickpeas, man. We eat a lot of lentils and she makes all these crazy dishes with obviously a ton of turmeric and lots of, you know, I don't know what she puts in it, but it's pretty great. And she has one tonight we're, we're making called Taj Mahal, right? And this is my, my little secret. Every night before I go to bed, I eat a fresh apple with one tablespoon of almond butter. How am I doing? Well, you're doing pretty good. Uh, however, I would say that it sounds like you're not really getting a, a whole lot of protein. Um, you mentioned that you, you do a protein shake, but I'm just assuming that one protein shake has, what, 25 to 30 grams of protein? Yeah, it's 35, I think. 35 yeah. or 38. The, the, the issue is... Um, I mean, protein, I mentioned how satiating it is, but that's not, that's, that's, that's sort of a, a separate issue. As we get older, we tend to become anabolic resistant and it becomes more difficult to maintain and, and in, indeed grow new muscle mass and being strong and robust, uh, as we age, um, really is an important determinant of, of longevity and health span, uh, today. So we actually require more protein. Um, and higher quality protein, particularly in the context of a lower protein diet. Um, so you're on a plant-based diet. Plant-based proteins tend not to be um, as high quality as animal proteins, both from the standpoint of concentration of essential amino acids, as well as their digestibility. So there's what's called the digestible indispensable amino acid score, which um, looks at how uh, well various types of proteins are absorbed, um, broken down and absorbed in the GI tract. Usually they use animals to do this, like pigs, for example. Um, but plant protein tends to not be as well absorbed. And it also tends to be lower in essential amino acids, particularly leucine, which is the amino acid that's most important. It's the most important sort of um, linchpin for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So for you, I would recommend uh, increasing the protein, maybe, you know, more, you know, more of those protein shakes or a, or a double dose or even more um, at this point. And uh, the only thing that I'll say, you know, about protein um, supplements when it comes to plant based protein supplements is that some of them can harbor heavy metals. So it is it's, it's well known to be more difficult to get um, adequate protein on a plant based diet. And I think that protein supplementation can certainly be useful, but you just want to make sure that you're getting from a brand that, and I have no brand affiliation and I don't actually know about Garden of Life, but um, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the brand, but you want to make sure that uh, they make available their certificate of analysis where you can then go and look to make sure that there's not excess levels of, for example, lead and cadmium, which tends to make their way into these, into these protein powders. Um, protein powders that use rice protein, for example, sometimes can have arsenic. Uh, which is not good. So overall, your diet looked great. I mean, you're getting obviously ample fiber, you're getting, you know, lots of healthy, slow burning carbohydrates, but it's the protein thing that I would say. Also, I didn't, I didn't hear you mention a, a source of omega three fatty acids, right? Which we know is important for the brain. Yeah. And, uh, and my wife, as it ages. Yeah, my wife and I have spoken about that, because back before we were vegans, right, we ate a lot of salmon, mm -hmm. right, just a ton of salmon, we know that's a superfood, we you know, and you know, it's a little bit like raspberries, blueberries, you know, it's in the family of like, got to eat that, you know, because it's, it's like, and we loved it, right? Uh, maybe I should be pescatarian, but it's too late. My, my wife's got me down this path. However, I think, you know, in the book, you are, how do I want to say this? Um, 
when you got to the topic of vegans, if you will, right? You know, I did hear the eye roll. It was, it was a little, it was sort of in the background, you know, but I could, I could sort of hear the, uh, the, the eyes rolling into the back of your head. And so we're not fundamentalist vegans, as I mentioned, I don't make my own clothes. I, you know, I don't, I, I wear, <laughs> I'm not wearing a hemp shirt right now. Uh, I'm, you know, we, I wear a leather belt. I'm actually wearing leather shoes right now. So it's really not a, you know, I listen, if, if, if my diet somehow is a byproduct of it is, is that it helps the planet. Okay. I'm all for it, but you know, that's not my primary reason. It's not an ethical reason. It's, you know, it's just, you know, a health reason because I have diabetes all over my family. And even though I'm thin and I work out a lot, my blood sugar is always high. Okay. And, um, uh, I, I need to bring my cholesterol levels down. And when we went to, you know, this style of eating, those numbers plummeted, right? They, like all, they, they all improved. They all improved pretty dramatically. Uh, and so, you know, it kind of worked. So just, just for me personally, most people listening aren't vegans, but am I doing okay? Or do I got to start eating beef? Yeah, no, you don't. I mean, I, I actually just posted a, 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 a 2022 meta analysis that found that red meat had, has no impact on um, measures of glycemic control. So it's not red meat doesn't cause diabetes, but you're right in that animal fat can drive levels of LDL cholesterol up, um, especially in susceptible people, people who might have familial hypercholesterolemia, for example. Um, I take the stance that you can always opt for leaner meats, um, but that ultimately the consumption of red meat, uh, while it will drive your LDL up higher than a no meat diet, the benefits um, of eating red meat outweigh the risks because it tends to be a very nutrient dense food. Uh, so I would be curious to see, you know, how, how like how much your markers have improved um, as a result in that switch. What else? Because people don't switch. People don't like when they when they make such a dramatic change to their diet. There are many variables that change at the same time. It's not just one variable, mm -hmm. right? So I would be interested to see, you know, maybe like a food journal of before and after. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you found a diet that 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 you think works for you, then I'm all for it. I'm not a uh, you know, I'm not dogmatic in the sense that ultimately I don't care what people, I want people to, to be able to make the best, the choices that are going to be the best for them. I'm not here to push my diet on other people. For me, what's important is that people, when, when choosing a dietary pattern, it's informed consent today on social media and with doc, you know, diet documentaries on the streaming platforms, it's very hard to get a sense of what is true and what is not about diet, right? Some documentaries, um, for example, that provide a very compelling case will will state wrongly that eating eggs is akin to smoking cigarettes, which is simply not true. Um, so, you know, if if you found a diet that that works for you, I'm I'm all for it. I will say that my mother, whose health was very bad um, for many years, was predominantly was on a predominantly vegetarian diet. So. Um, and, you know, she ate in accordance with what the recommendations that she, through osmosis, was able to glean from mainstream media and the, and the lay press. She ate the diet that she thought was going to be best for cardiovascular health, right? So um, she ate a, ultimately a very low saturated fat diet. I never saw her eat red meat. I never saw her eat eggs. I'm not being hyperbolic. She never ate eggs because she was afraid of the diet of the cholesterol that they contained in the yolk. When she did eat animal products, it was usually lean, skinless chicken breast um, and fish. But even even those foods, she didn't understand the value of protein. You know, I mean, she wasn't deficient in protein, but um, she ate a, a, a diet that would have won over the hearts and mind of, minds of any dietitian of the 70s and 80s. And um, and it it didn't it certainly didn't protect her. Um, and and I. My hypothesis, which of course I'd never be able to test, um, but would be that if she had a, a diet that was more balanced um, and, and provided a greater array of nutrient dense um, animal animal sourced options, um, it, it would have potentially protected her to some degree. I'm not saying that what she developed is her fault or anything like that, but I do think that you know that when it comes to uh, describing a biologically appropriate diet for for humans, I mean, I think omnivory is is the way. But but 
I don't try to push my diet on, on anybody. You know, I think like if, and, and everybody's different. And, and as you've said multiple times, which I completely agree with, there is no such thing as a one size fits all diet. So, um, so if it's, if it's working for you, that's, that makes me happy. That's enough for me. All right. I love that you use the word happy uh, and we can sort of uh, begin to sort of tail into this. We've talked a lot about science. We've talked a lot about the research. We've spoken a lot about you know, kind of the drier side of the conversation. But food is about joy. Food is about happiness. Food is about, you know, it, it's, it has a powerful social dimension to it, right? And that's why I also like Genius Kitchen, because you really go into the fact that food should contain not only good nutrients, but joy, right? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, food is like, I'm a big nutrition nerd, so I can talk until the cows come home about literally. micronutrients. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> micronutrients, macronutrients. I just, I love it. I love being mindful of what I put into my body, and I like feeling that I'm being strengthened by, you know, my, my dietary choices. But you're right. Food is a, it's it's a celebration. It's how we bond with one another. It's how we connect. It's how we show love. It's how we... Um, you know, me meetings we set over meals, right? Date night. It's always over a meal. So I wanted to write a book that paid homage to um, the joy of cooking and eating. And I, I think that that's what um, I was able to accomplish in, in Genius Kitchen. And so for me, there's no greater feeling than preparing something f f with and for ultimately my loved ones and seeing them from across the table smile in delight at what I've prepared for them. And also me knowing that what I've prepared pre prepared for them is nourishing their bodies uh, in profound ways. So there's a lot of, I think, in the wellness world online, black or white thinking, dietary dogma. People have very strained relationships with, with food these days, um, both men and women. Uh, but, you know, for me, it's about getting back to, I think, um, common sense when it comes to when it comes to food and, and not, you know, not fear mongering. Ultimately, there's no single food that's going to improve your health or be a detriment to your health. It's about the dietary pattern as a whole. It's about what the kinds of foods that you're eating mostly day in and day out. Um, and so I kind of wanted to like, you know, plant my flag in, in that concept uh, in the new book. And I'm a foodie at the end of the day. I love I love eating good food and, and cooking. And I'm not a trained chef. I learned on the job, so to speak. So in writing this book, I wanted to make it really easy for people. Um, I wanted to show people how to cook recipes that were more complex, that were that, you know, had the ability to blow their minds in terms of what they're able to create in their own kitchens. But also, I provide instruction for really basic uh, foods as well. For example, I think it's really important that people know how to poach an egg or um, you know, make something as simple as a, as a steak, which can be a very nutrient dense food, or even a burger patty, which can be a very, uh, economical and nutrient dense food, um, for, for many people. The book is a, also has a range as I'm sure you've picked up on Ian. It's, it's, it's not just, uh, meat dishes. There's a lot of seafood dishes, a ton of plant-based dishes. Um, so no matter what your dietary, uh, preference is, um, I've tried to make it a really sort of broadly applicable uh, resource for people. Max, do you know what I miss? Tell me. Bacon. I want to <laughs> just say, I want to talk about bacon for a minute. I think, I think bacon is the sex of food. I really do. I, I just don't have any doubt about it. And no matter what you say, I will tell you now, bacon is healthy. Especially I don't care a... what you tell me. Bacon is good for you. What do you say, Max? Give your body what it wants. All right. Come on. You're pretty, pretty sure the car. I, I, it's wrapped around a, a pepper with, filled with cheese, and it's got the crisp on it. It's been smoked on the Kamado Joe. <laughs> yeah. We I actually, there's there's a recipe in the book for salmon skin bacon. I don't know if you've tried that. I know you're not eating fish currently, but um, I here's the thing. Bacon, I think, is good. Um, I'm not... See, I'm not in this like sort of keto, paleo, even though I, I, I sometimes get pegged as such. Uh, I'm not a big like, let's just overdo the animal fat either. I think there's a, a place for bacon um, and, I, and I love it. I certainly eat it. Um, butter and fatty meat and things like that. But I do think that for most people, it's probably wise to, um, you know, to, to eat predominantly, as I mentioned, whole foods. So 
uh, foods that, that are providing nutrients other than pure fat, which is the case with butter, for example. And bacon is an, is an interesting food. I mean, bacon, it's often uh, cured with nitrate um, compounds and the presence of protein and, and high heat, uh, unless you're eating that food with um, a source of vitamin C, actually can can yield some pretty nasty compounds. Now, in moderation, uh, would I be worried about it? No, not at all. But, you know, is bacon the kind of food that I would that I would personally eat every single every single morning? Probably not. Um, I think that there are there are healthier sort of options out there. Like I'm a huge fan of eggs. I think eggs are amazing. Um, but uh, bacon for taste gets a gets a thumbs up. Bacon for health gets a sort of you know it's neither here nor there for me. <laughs> so speaking of bacon, eggs, the enneagram, uh, you just triggered something for me. My mom who's an enneagram too. She's always like, well, let me cook you something, baby. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta have a good breakfast. Is there a best meal of the day? Oh man, like a best time to eat. Well, I think I think the the meal that you break your fast with, so breakfast, I guess, would be that for most people. That's an important meal. You want to make sure that you're setting off on the right foot, yeah. prioritizing protein, fiber, uh, things like that. Um, so yeah, there's not like one meal of the day that's more important than the others, though. They're all they're all pretty important. Also, snacking, what, picking your snacks wisely is important. You want to pick a snack that that is satiating, that's not going to trigger um, residual hunger. I think that's a, you know, that's pretty smart. Um, some people thrive on one meal a day. It's called OMAD. Others thrive on two meals a day, three meals a day. I personally eat two meals a day and I have uh, like a protein shake and, uh, you know, like a piece or two of whole fruit um, midday. That that tends to hold me over pretty well. All right. So I'm glad you said that because I often only eat two meals a day. I eat Sometimes I have a breakfast burrito that I, it's a vegan burrito. We get around the corner, thin little, uh, you know, whatever we call it, flour tortilla with tons of black beans. And I got to say, it's got some crispy potatoes in it. It's quite delicious, right? Yeah, with a little hot it. sauce, right? And then I don't eat anything until dinner. I might have a shake in the afternoon. Sometimes I just forget because I'm really full from what I ate in the morning all the way up until five or six o'clock at night. Yeah. Right. So you know, that's, you know, often my pattern. And if, if I'm not hungry, why eat? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, Listen like, well, I, I think when you're not hungry, it's called sport eating. You know, <laughs> it's just like, I'm just going to eat, you know, I'm just going to kill it to eat it. It doesn't really matter. I just, right. you know, I'm, it's here. So I'm going to do it. Um, so as we wrap up here, Max, um, I want to tell you a little bit about my mom. Uh, my mom is 93 years old and she is now just in the sort of mid stage of dementia, I think, you know, so, but she's 93 and I'm always like, well, it's kind of her job description, right? I mean, she's 93 years old. Eventually stuff begins to happen, right? Cause your diet is not going to make you immortal, right? I mean, there is, we want to have the highest quality of life, the highest possible degree of health as we can for as long as we can. But at the end of the day, death wins, right? I mean, there's just, you know, there's just no way around it. But my mom is like a force of nature. I kid you not. She ate a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich every morning for her entire life. This woman would pound bacon like it was like the end of the world and it was all that was left. And she, I'm not kidding you, man. She smoked for 75 years. She wow. smoked a pack of Pall Malls, non-filtered cigarettes every day for, you know, forever, Right. Um, she eats the, Anthony, I don't know if I ever told you this. She eats an Entenmann's coffee ring, you know, with that like wild white icing on top. Like she'll go through one every two days. Yum. Right. Bro. And, and I, eats whatever she wanted, always ate whatever she wanted, was never overweight. So let's talk about genetics just for one second here. Right. Cause wouldn't that be genetics? I mean, she has no high blood pressure. In fact, her blood pressure is arguably too low. Um, because she would have, um, oh, I used to know what it was, you know, when you stand up and you begin to have, like, you get dizzy, you feel like you're going to faint. I can't remember what it's called anyway. Yeah. Um, postural hypertension, that's what it's called. Um, and she would, I mean, literally ate what she wanted, did what she wanted. I never saw her exercise a day in my life. The woman wore high heels to bed. Okay. So genetics. Genetics do play an important role. They do. Um, you know, people, your mom is, a, is an anecdote. Uh, there are, I'm sure you could find easily people who smoke and don't get 
lung cancer and you'll find others that do. And yeah, so genetics, genetics do play a role, but, um, but I think at this point it's, we have to acknowledge the role that diet, you know, and lifestyle can play in, in, in leading to, uh, successful aging for the general population. There's always going to be outliers, genetic freaks. We have like what's called polygenic risk, right? So people might have one genetic risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease, right? But then they have other yet to be described, uh, genes that are effectively negating their, their possession of, a uh, you know, an Alzheimer's genetic risk factor. So we don't really, we don't know um, all of the genes that are associated with longevity. We have certain proteins that we know are associated like FOXO3 and uh, CERT1. And these are all sort of being like investigated and they're controversial. But I think um, for most people, I think the, the important takeaway is one of agency, one of one of empowerment. Whether or not you have these genes, you can make choices in your day to day life that are going to improve your odds um, of living a long and healthy life. So my mother essentially, we like to say my mother is Keith Richards. She just, <laughs> you know, she's like the, she should be replacing Johnny Depp on Pirates of the Caribbean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's my mom. All right, everybody. I'm talking to my friend, Max Lukavir, right? Yeah. I this was so there. fun. Right? It's a genius kitchen, over 100 easy and delicious recipes to make your brain sharp, body strong, and taste buds happy. Genius Foods, the New York Times bestseller. Become smarter, happier, and more productive while protecting your brain for life. I will tell you, this is I am. This is not me uh, being um, Mr. Advertising Wise. This is actually true. My wife is a freak for Genius Foods. I think it's obviously fantastic, and we got a lot of books like this in my house. So for me to say that it's a legitimate endorsement. Okay, I want you all to go out and get it, Max. How do people find you uh, on social media, website, all that stuff? You're too kind. Um, so I host my own podcast. It's called The Genius Life. So if you like listen to, listening to podcasts, you can come and check that out. I'm very active on Instagram at Max Lugavir, and it's spelled L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. And then, yeah, grab uh, grab Genius Foods, grab Genius Kitchen. Um, somewhere in between the two, I, I released a, a, another book called, it's sort of the middle child called The Genius Life. You can pick up the trilogy uh, if you'd like to own it all. But um, but yeah, I'm super proud of these books. And the most recent one was Genius Kitchen. So it's a cookbook. It's got beautiful photography in it. Um, I think people are really going to love that one. Max, thanks for Enneagram 3, Max. Thanks for being on the show. It, it was a delight to have you. And to all of you out there, my friends, may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time. Bye.